So welcome back uh, to everyone uh, from, uh, from our luncheon break. Uh, I am uh, Dan Burke. I teach patent law and intellectual property here at the University of California, Irvine School of Law. Um, and it sounds like we need to use a little bit of amplification uh, in the room. So I'm going to uh, grab this lavalier mic and I will hand this off to our keynote speaker in just a moment. Uh, I'm here to introduce our keynote speaker. Um, my colleague, uh, David Kay. Uh, experiential learning has been a core principle of the UC Irvine uh, Law School since we founded it eight years ago, and so we were delighted uh, when Professor Kay joined us here to direct the Human Rights Clinic. Uh, he uh, teaches here, he is uh, internationally active, and uh, in particular, he is the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Right of Freedom of Opinion and Expression. Uh, he's going to draw on that experience to talk to us now about uh, the right to surf. Now, we're about five, ten minutes from some pretty good beaches uh, here in Orange County, uh, but I think he may be talking about a slightly different kind of uh, right to surf, uh, and so I'm happy to uh, turn the time over to Professor David Kaye. Thank you. All right, I'm going to get hooked up here. I wonder if it'll pick up my heartbeat, my racing heartbeat. I'm so nervous. No, um, so uh, it's true. I don't surf. I feel like I should have a right to surf. Um, what, what I want to talk about today is uh, first to thank Dan for inviting me, um, and thanks to all of you for uh, for participating in this uh, in this conference in this in this symposium. Um, and I found this morning's, I'm not an IP lawyer um, or academic, but I found this morning's panel is really enriching. So thanks to the panelists for, uh, for their presentations this morning. So what I want to do in a way is turn to focus on human rights law. Hi, Ruth. Um, and, um, and in doing so, what I really want to focus in on is Article 19 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights as sort of the basis for, for the analysis. And um, let me see how I can do this. There we are. This is Article 19 of the ICCPR. And the reason why I want to focus on, in on it first, and this will be the most text you will see on my slides, I promise you. And you don't have to read these either. I'll summarize them. Basically, for my talk, what I'm looking at is the perspective of the person who's seeking information, right? So, of course, Article 19, Paragraph 1, protects everyone's right to hold an opinion without interference. That's an unconditional right. But what I'm really interested in for the purposes of this talk are Articles 19, Paragraph 2 and 3. So Paragraph 2 protects everyone's right, right to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas of all kinds, regardless of frontiers, which the regardless of frontiers language, I feel like, you know, this is from 1948, 1949, and regard, they put in regardless of frontiers. They're probably thinking broadcast, radio, maybe they're thinking early versions of Sami's Dot or something like that, but it really describes the internet um, to a large extent. Um, and it's either orally in writing or in print, in the form of art, or through any other media. And that's, I think, a very broad right. Now, Normally speaking, when we talk about restrictions on freedom of opinion and expression, particularly here, Article um, 19.2 um, expression, most of the action is around paragraph three. And as we were talking about the three steps earlier, we also, in freedom of expression, have our three-part test. And the three-part test means that if a state is going to restrict freedom of expression, um, it has to demonstrate three things. One that the restriction is provided by law, two, that it's necessary and proportionate, and three, it's necessary and proportionate in order to protect a specific government objective. Right? And they're actually laid out right here. Rights or reputations of others, or the protection of national security or of public order, or of public health or morals. So this is the standard by which I'm basically giving this, um, giving this talk. Um, and we'll come back to it from time to time, but I wanted to lay that out there so that you understand that in my talk, I'm not really focusing in on the right of the content producer, although that person is relevant to this analysis, but really looking at access to information and everyone's right to seek 
and receive information. And now, who's the worst actor out there? This is for Molly. This is, um, it's, it's squirrels. I mean, squirrels are clearly the worst kind of actor. No, we had a workshop up at UConn on Monday, and, and like two-thirds of campus went down because a squirrel uh, chewed up a, an electrical line, brought down the internet, and obviously made us think that, you know, put aside internet shutdowns and so forth, it's really the squirrels. So in thinking first about access to information, I think it's useful to, to divide up, and, the, and my talk will really proceed in basically three grounds. So one is kind of brute force efforts of governments to restrict access to information. So I'll talk first about those kind of brute force or extra legal approaches to uh, access to information. Um, then I'm going to talk about so the government um, private sector relationship and how governments are increasingly relying on the private sector which has obviously taken over so much of the public space around expression, but how governments are actually using the private sector in order to restrict information and access to information. And then third, I'll talk about some interesting, at least interesting to me, hopefully they'll be interesting to you, um, legal challenges that are out there. And that'll be maybe the heart of, of what I want to talk about at the, in the last 10 minutes or so of the talk. So I'm going to try to go through the brute force uh, fairly quickly. Obviously, when we're talking about brute force or extra legal approaches, um, there are some that probably come to mind pretty quickly, right? So one is um, the, the lack of access to information in China, right? So the, the government's actual use of filtering and throttling techniques in order to restrict the free flow of information. Now, some of that is by law in China. And in fact, most of it is. It's a government. Um, as Jeff Wasserstrom and I were mentioning earlier, it's a government by law, not necessarily the rule of law, but it's certainly in law that the government has the authority to throttle and to filter all sorts of information that might be coming into the country. Um, other form of just brute force uh, f um, attacks on access to information are internet shutdowns. And we're seeing this increasing uh, around the world. And this is from Access Now, uh, which is a New York-based organization, which has documented in 2015, 15 internet shutdowns. Just um, in the first six months of 2016, 20 internet shutdowns. Now, these are essentially where um, a government typically orders a telco um, or an ISP to shut down the internet. Sometimes it's nationwide. Sometimes it's in a specific sector. We just saw yesterday, for example, this is Syria. So you can see there's access up until a little bit after 2 o'clock UTC. And the government ordered the telecom in Aleppo to bring down the internet. right? And that's this obviously very steep drop off just after 2. So governments are increasingly using their brute force power in order to deny access to information. Other kinds of um, sort of brute force actions or extra legal actions is spyware, right? So around the world, and this is from Citizen Lab, which is a University of Toronto-based um, organization that does really important research into the technical aspects of access to information. They've demonstrated that at least these countries are using FinFisher spyware, which is a is a um, is a private privately available. Uh, spyware um, that's being used in order to infect computers around the world with malware and then spy on, conduct surveillance over activists, journalists, and others, political opponents and others around the world. Some of this is actually cross-border. So as an example, Ethiopia infected the computer of an Ethiopian-American activist in Maryland uh, a couple of years ago. And basically, with this Finn Fisher spyware every week was sending back data from this activist's computer. The Electronic Frontier Foundation is actually suing Ethiopia in federal court in Washington. It's, um, it's before the DC circuit now. Um, and this is just another example of targeting particular individuals through boot force. And then of course there's, this is Banksy, um, there's surveillance, right? There's just this sort of the general surveillance that governments are, are using around the world in order to, um, for some, some purposes, are legitimate. 
right? Some pur purposes are counterterrorism, um, countering extremism, and so forth. But in many parts of the world, this is being conducted outside of rule of law. Okay, I think these have a very, um, a, a very direct connection to what we've been talking about today in terms of access to information. Um, and, and here's sort of a, a bit of a transition, right? So this is, this is from a, a digital attack map. And this shows um, the attack from last, uh, uh, last Friday, which many of you may have, been, may have heard about, which was an attack on um, DIN Corporation, which manages the DNS, um, the, um, the domain names uh, around the world. Um, but particularly this attack on an American company brought down um, Twitter, LinkedIn, a number of other um, platforms. And what we're seeing is attacks on access to information aren't just government directed. We actually don't know yet who directed this particular attack. Um, but the tools of attacking access to information are expanding. They're expanding beyond governments. OK, so that was sort of, sort of the brute force aspect of access to information. Those are, I would say, generally speaking, failures when it comes to the rule of necessity and proportionality that's necessary that a government must show in order to uh, restrict freedom of expression, to restrict access to information. Now, governments are not always just using a kind of brute force approach. They're also using law. And this has become a particular problem in the context of, um, of countering violent extremism. We've seen a rash of new laws around the world that are really directed to um, giving the government, giving governments more authority in order to restrict the free flow of information online. Now, this is from the Madli Sashura. This is um, Pakistan, which just adopted in August uh, its Prevention of Electronic Crimes Bill, which contains a number of provisions that I think are of concern, certainly from the IP perspective, um, but more generally um, raise concerns across the board when it comes to access to information. In part, I would mention two, two things that we see in something like Pakistan's new law. So one is uh, undermining digital security. And this is something that, um, that I addressed about a year and a half ago in a report to the Human Rights Council. And this is a problem where governments are increasingly looking at tools like anonymity and encryption as threats to national security or threats to um, the protection of the rights or reputations of others. What we see in the Pakistani law, this new law, the prevention, the PECB, is really an effort not only to undermine digital security, but to attack digital security and to suggest that the mere use of security in one's communications is um, evidence of uh, some kind of nefarious behavior. And so this is one set of problems that we see in these new cyber laws. The other set of laws is basically an attack on expression more generally and in a way that is vague and provides excessive discretion to governments to attack artists, to attack writers, to attack journalists who the government believes are implicating, um, say, extremism. Now, this is a problem in particular in the Pakistani law. But, and this is one of the problems I'll address at the very end, this isn't only a problem of you know, Pakistan or Iran or Russia or countries where you might say, well, they're not necessarily going to provide an open uh, environment for freedom of expression. We also see these kinds of laws emerging in France, which in its emergency powers legislation over the last year, since Charlie Hebdo, but in particular, since last um, November 13th attacks in Paris, um, the French government has adopted new laws that really restrict digital security um, and provide access um, for surveillance purposes uh, to wireless communications and all sorts of other uh, communications. Now, that was just struck down, actually, on Friday, a part of the new French law related to surveillance of wireless technology. So there may be some pushback there. But one of the problems is the governments in places where there's already a freedom of expression problem are seeing the model of the West, and, that, and it's not a particularly good model.
The last part that I'll mention here before talking about some more generic legal challenges is an issue of internet governance. So as I mentioned, you have China and its Great Wall. You have other forms of brute force attack on the internet. You also have, I would say, a governance attack on freedom online. So generally speaking, the internet functions internationally through what we call a multi-stakeholder approach, right? It involves governments, civil society, technologists, academics, private companies who are all involved in the maintenance of the infrastructure um, and the free flow of information, the interoperability of the internet worldwide. Some governments, in particular China, but also Russia, would like that to be a government-driven process. Um, they'd like government to be in charge of dealing with infrastructure, but also dealing with the basic rules of jurisdiction by which there's notice and takedown and other processes that make the internet really work the way it does today. So this is one of the looming threats, I think, that are out there. So far, the multi-stakeholder approach has been solid, um, but there's still pushback from governments, particularly in the ITU context, in the international telecommunications union. So I think it's something we should be definitely watching. So in the last few minutes, what I want to talk about, so I guess about five minutes, um, I want to talk about some of the key problems, I think, that are out there. First starting, at least the key problems that are going to have to have a kind of normative and a legal uh, response, whether it's from companies, so from the private sector, or it's from governments. So one is, and this is a sort of segue from the government side strictly to the government interaction with private companies. So one is that governments are increasingly using private companies' terms of service in order to seek the takedown of content that they themselves might not have the authority to do if it were their own, if it were on in a public space, for example. So for example, here we have um, in Twitter's transparency report, uh, identification of all of the requests from, these are from the top you know, 10 or 12 countries from around the world, removal requests that come by court order, which many of the companies are going to be more amenable to a court order for a takedown request, which is as it should be. Um, but they're also getting thousands of requests that are not by court order for different kinds of, of takedowns. This is increasing and it's putting a lot of pressure on the private companies, not only as a matter of resources to handle these requests, but also as a, as a legal matter, what we're seeing is the companies are put in, the, in, the, um, in a situation of having to determine what is lawful and what is unlawful. And that's, that's not necessarily new. We've seen that in all sorts of notice and takedown uh, situations around the world. But this is putting significant pressure, particularly when the expression has a political valence. Now, what, what do those requests look like? Um, so I went to the Google Transparency Report to, to give you some examples, um, just to show the kinds of requests that are, that are coming from governments in order to take down content. As Google says, some of this is political content and government criticism. Some of it is citing defamation, privacy, and even copyright laws. So to give a couple of examples, um, in the United States, the Greensboro Police Department um, gave, uh, issued to, to Google a takedown notice to remove a YouTube video criticizing police brutality. The video displayed the department's logo. Um, so Google, doing what it should do, asked the claimant for more information, um, didn't hear back, so they didn't remove it. That's, that's actually not a bad process. They get something, they ask for more, they get a request, they ask for more detail, right? In the UAE, Google received a request from the Telecommunications Regulatory Authority, so an administrative process, uh, to remove a YouTube video. Um, the video contained footage of a member of the royal family torturing Sudanese workers in his farm. They didn't re remove it for public interest reasons. Um, you could go to the Google Transparency Report. It's, if, you, if you Google it, <laughs> you'll find it very, very easily. I'm sure they've manipulated that so it would come up quickly. But there are many others here um, that we could go through that we just we don't have time to do. But there, I think you'll find them very interesting. And you'll see especially that governments are increasingly using the language of copyright, the, the language of notice and takedown, in order to seek uh, 
uh, the removal of, of content. Now, this, is, this puts uh, companies in a, in a difficult position, particularly they're in a position where even more generally, publics are concerned about the kind of content that's up there, whether it's extremism um, that you see on Twitter or uh, anti-Semitism. I usually, I like to post this one because I thought Kabbalists would be with a K, but this I guess is referring to a cabal, which is a different use anyway. Um, so, so the companies are facing, they're facing a problem, not just on the copyright side, not just on the political content side, but on the abuse side. And this is, um, for a company like Twitter, um, this is becoming a real problem for, for its business, actually, as we've seen over the last couple of weeks. Okay, so I'm gonna just really quickly go over a few, a few key issues that I think are worth thinking about, um, that I think are really hard legal issues that courts around the world are struggling with, and then I'll, then I'll close, and I'm sorry if I'm going over a little bit. So the first one is intermediary liability. Right, so in the European context, we've actually seen a bit of a struggle with um, first the Delphi case, um, in which the European Court of Human Rights basically found Delphi, which is an Estonian, um, it's kind of like an Estonian Huffington Post, I guess you might say. It's a, um, it's a news site and a news aggregator site in which individuals would do a lot of commenting, be a ton of comments, um, and some of the comments, and in the particular case in which this arose, are pretty hateful and actually involve, um, you know, violent-oriented kind of language. Not necessarily incitement, but certainly violent language. In, in the Delphi case, without going into any detail here, the court decided that because this was anonymous commenting and the court couldn't identify and Delphi couldn't identify the commenters, um, and because this was clearly unlawful speech, which is, was actually a tendentious claim by the court, but nonetheless, because it was hate speech, the court said that Delphi bore responsibility um, for that, um, for any claims that might be posed by the targets of that speech. In other words, Delphi, the intermediary, is liable for that. Now, the court is has been walking this back a little bit, and there was a case that was announced in, I think it was in February, that came out of Hungary, where the court was trying to walk back a little and to be a little bit clearer about what notice and takedown might look like, um, but it's still far behind other countries. So for example, India, um, about a year and a half ago, uh, in a very important intermediary liability decision, uh, found that in order for the intermediary to be, li to be liable, not only must they have notice, um, but they must have had an opportunity to react to the, to the clearly unlawful speech. So there are rules that are developing around the world that are dealing with intermediary liability. I'm afraid that the European court isn't getting it right quite yet. Maybe they're heading in the direction. But one of the risks here is that if liability is put particularly on the smaller news portals, it will crowd out all sorts of speech, particularly comments. I mean, I'm not recommending that anybody go through comment sections of, of, any, <laughs> of any site, but um, but it, it could result in a um, in sort of a, a chilling of, of the comment approach online. Other problem is right to be forgotten. Now, we could spend a whole symposium or a whole course on right to be forgotten, but I think the point here that I want to make is that if you go to Google's site and you look at how you would uh, seek, if you're a European, how you would seek the removal of a material, you'll see that it the standard is where the interests in those results. So basically what's happening is um, an individual will say, I want you to delist this particular site. It's not removing the site from the internet, but it's delinking it from Google search results. And the person has to show that um, their privacy rights outweigh other rights, for example, right of freedom of expression. The, the issue here is, first of all, Google's getting tens of thousands of these requests and they are in the position of acting as essentially judge and jury, and there's not a whole lot of transparency about that process. Now, that's a problem in and of itself that may be resolved, but there are two problems looming. One is it's globalizing, so the French government is now requesting that Google not only remove content under right to be forgotten within the European space. So if it's a European, you know, .fr or .es, et cetera, but if it's google.com, um, France wants you to remove it, wants Google to delist it as well. The other globalizing problem 
is that we're seeing right to be forgotten laws expand around the world, perhaps lacking at least some of the, the rule of law orientation that, you're, that you do see in the European context. And the last point that I'll mention is, um, um, is the issue of data localization. So this is an issue both of jurisdiction. I mean, this, is, this was born with the internet, right? Um, wh where is our data? But increasingly, of course, the private companies hold their data on server farms around the world, and that's the location in many countries. Russia, for example, is saying that if you want to do business in our, in our country, all of our citizens' data needs to be located on servers in our country. Obviously, to get access to it for surveillance purposes, for legal process, for other purposes. So there's a nefarious kind of angle to data localization. But there's also the cross-jurisdictional issues that arise, um, for example, in the safe harbor issue that came up in the Schrems case um, in, the, in the Court of Justice, uh, the European Court of Justice. So, so these are issues that I think are really going to be important to resolve over the next couple of years. Now, I'm just going to conclude with, there are just a few things that I would say to end, and I'm sorry that I've gone over a little bit. I think in order to solve these problems, um, it's going to take time. I mean, it's going to take years to solve some of these problems. Of course, on the brute force problem, it requires activists and litigation and pushing back and fair internet and multi-stakeholder internet governance. Um, but even apart from that, I think there's some basics that, that governments and the private sector need to be observing. One is transparency. If we don't know what governments and the private sector are doing, it's impossible to challenge what they're doing. And we don't see a lot of transparency, transparency in this space. We need rule of law and accountability. Right? This goes to the provided by law requirement in Article 19 of the ICCPR. In order to um, ensure that, um, that takedowns, that freedom of expression is not unduly restricted, we need to see rule of law happening. That means secret law is a very serious problem. And we need to see accountability when there are takedowns um, that are unlawful, um, which we generally do not see much of. We need to see due diligence by companies. So when companies are engaging in different markets, we need to see that they're actually taking measures in order to mitigate human rights concerns that they might, they might be facing. Um, and, and we're frankly not seeing that. And that's both entry into markets and exit from markets. And then finally, modeling. One of the main problems I see is that um, the bad stuff is happening out there, right? All of that brute force kind of approach to freedom of expression. But at the same time, we're not necessarily, not, not necessarily seeing good behavior or model behavior from countries in the West. And it's really important, whether we're talking about surveillance or we're talking about the interaction between governments and the private sector, or we're talking about any number of other issues where governments are regulating expression, could even be the definition of, for example, in France, the glorification of terrorism or the glorification of extremism. These are issues that, around the world, people are drawing from. They're saying, if the French can do it, we can do it. If the UK can do it, we can do it. They may not be doing it in the same rule of law context that we're familiar with, but they're still using these models, and it's uh, serving as, as a real problem. So with that, I'm sorry to have gone over, but thank you all for your time.